Hello, hobby friends, and welcome to another episode of Hobby Talk Live. I'm David Baez, and today we're going to dive into the world of hockey cards. And here to talk to us about the history of hockey cards and his own personal collection is season collector and hobby friend, Michael Honeyman. Michael, welcome to Hobby Talk, buddy. How are you? Hi, David. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I can't wait to uh, hear your pronunciation of last names and <laughs> 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 and talking some hockey here. This is long overdue, so thank you for doing this. Yeah, definitely. You have successfully snared the only hockey fan in California <laughs> to provide a perspective on hockey cards, so it should be very interesting. <laughs> Well said, my friend. So uh, as I always start my first interviews with a certain topic, I always like to kind of dive into um, a 101 for those that maybe aren't into um, hockey cards but want to learn more. So my first question out of the gate to you, Michael, is uh, what – let's get a one – let's do a 101, if you will. So what's the history behind the hockey cards in terms of, you know, uh, product and issues? You know, how did it all begin? Yeah, good question. So um, admittedly, my knowledge of hockey card history prior to the 50s is um, a little fuzzy, um, <laughs> but I can certainly do the best I can. Um, you know, I've been really lucky um, as I've been collecting Hockey Unopened um, to have an opportunity to get to know some really knowledgeable collectors, people that have um, been in the business um, and know a lot about hockey cards and hockey memorabilia and hockey in general, which is near and dear to my heart um, for a long time. And so, you know, I think like other um, sports cards, um, hockey cards were um, initially um, distributed um, with tobacco products, um, likely in Canada, although, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but it's where you find some of the legends of the game who now have, you know, trophies named after them. Right. Um, portrayed. So, you know, Georges Bezina, who, um, you know, obviously is the namesake for the Bezina trophy. So, you know, I think that those issues were really the first ones. And then, um, you know, I think sporadically um, between then, which was, you know, 1910s, um, and the 30s, there were, of course, other issues. Um, and then in the 30s, um, I think 1933, if I'm recalling correctly, um, Opeachy actually issued um, some hockey cards. Um, I've seen the cards wow, in the wrap. 1933. Wrappers. Yeah, I've never seen any unopened wow, packs of that product. Not to say they don't exist, but um, the... Um, the 30s were, you know, um, when Opeachy really um, entered the market. Um, and, and interestingly, um, you don't really see Opeachy again um, until the late 60s. Um, although right. I think there was some type of a distribution agreement with Topps um, where Opeachy was distributing cards in Canada, um, licensed by and branded by Top. So it wasn't until the late 60s where um, you saw Tops and Opeachy products in hockey actually being um, different issues, packaged differently. Um, right. So in the 50s, in 1954 specifically, um, Tops actually issued a um a hockey card release um and it contained um players from um the original six um so the six original national hockey league franchises if i recall correctly there's 55 cards in that set okay um and i was gonna say it, it can't be a big set that's for sure <laughs> no no it wasn't and it yeah. came shortly after um parkhurst started um, manufacturing cards. I believe their first issue was in 1951. Okay. And that's when you have Gordie Howe's rookie card. Um, right. The Parkhurst cards in 51 and 52 were actually very small. Um, they had super tiny pictures. Um, if I recall correctly, the 51s and maybe the 52s also had blank backs. 
um, the player information was on the front. Um, so but it was of literally course, just like a photo. Yes. Um, and the player's name and I think their team and position. Um, and you know, what's really interesting okay. is, um, you know, the 51 Parkhurst set contains Gordie Howe's rookie card. It contains um, Maurice Richard's rookie card. Um, and I believe there's some others in that set as well. But the cards, at least in my opinion, um, are not terribly appealing. Um, right. And the 52s, um, if I recall correctly, were a little bit larger. And then I think starting in 53, Parkhurst issued, um, you know, full-size cards. Right. Um, and some of the Parkhurst issues um, in the 50s only had, like, I think it might have been 57, only had Canadian teams. And okay. so the rapper even has the Maple Leafs logo and the Montreal Canadiens logo. And <laughs> that was all. Um, so wow. top issued in 54, um, the um, sort of primary, like, tops, well, really the primary tops hockey issue. Um, and you've got Gordy Howe's first tops card in there. So kind of like Mickey Mantle had his rookie in 51 Bowman, um, and then the mm -hmm. next year, you know, Topps issued, you know, the iconic 52 um, set and Mickey Mantle card. Right. Um, you know, Topps, I think, was maybe kind of sort of trying to replicate the same thing with hockey. Um, and the cards are beautiful. I mean, they're just absolutely amazing. Um, and I don't think they were very popular because Topps <laughs> didn't issue hockey cards the next year or the year after that. Um, <laughs> And then they came back in 57, um, okay. and the cards were actually the same size as um, the 57 baseball issue. So you probably remember pre-57, the cards were larger, and then right. in 57, Topps decided to use what is now, um, you know, the standard card size. I don't think that, you know, with the exception of some, you know, special issues, which I'll talk Next, about in a minute. With the exception of my Topps big. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, you had tall boys too. So, um, so yeah. Topps came back in 57 um, and then issued hockey cards every year. Um, again, Opeachy was not a separate product. And, you know, the sense I get is that um, most hockey cards were distributed in Canada. Right. Um, and, you know, we know now that they were obviously distributed in much lower numbers um, during those years than baseball cards were, or right. even football cards were, um, which is why you find unopened hockey product from that era, in many cases, to just be non-existent. Right. Um, and then in 68, um, Topps and Opeachy um, distributed separate products. So the top sets became much smaller. Um, mm -hmm. and the Opeachy sets, um, in many cases were issued in series, um, mm -hmm. and had many, many more cards, um, available. So I know show and tell is not until a little bit later, but <laughs> this is a 1968, um, Topps hockey pack. And, you know, the release here actually corresponded with an expansion of the National Hockey League. You can probably see on the wrapper, it says all 12 teams. And yeah. so the National Hockey League actually added a number of teams in the 1968 season. Um, I don't recall who all of them were, um, but the league grew substantially. And as it so happened, so did the, the hockey card market. Um, yeah. And so, you know, throughout the 60s or the late 60s after 68 and into the 70s, like, you know, Topps and Opeachy had separate issues for, for hockey cards. Um, and that continued, um, gosh, I mean, into the 90s, really. Right. Um, upper Deck got into it. Um, and, you know, obviously then, you know, you have the market today with all of the, you know. I was going to say, you had score as well. Factor, you, had, you know, yeah. everything that, you know, is is fancy about, you know, all the of the new cards. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. One thing I do notice, Michael, in every, uh, let's call it, John, every sport rather that we talk about is um, that pivotal 80s into junk wax era seems to have a similar 
kind of progression, if you will, and that, you know, there's a, a lot of different options. There's uh, even now in the modern market, right? There's, you know, nothing's really deviated. They have the refractors, they have the autos, they have the the parallels, if you will. So it's kind of like following suit. I mean, there's, I mean, as far as I know, and maybe you can correct, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, they're, they're, they're not really shifting gears in terms of what they're doing from a business standpoint. I mean, hockey's kind of had that same progression. Is that a fair, fair statement on my part? Yeah, I think so. I mean, really the early nineties was kind of when that, that all materialized. Um, you know, if you look at hockey products, I think, you know, in the late eighties, really when hockey's popularity exploded in the U.S. when Wayne Gretzky, um, you know, got traded from the Oilers to the Kings yeah. um, on August the 9th, 1988. I remember. Oh, wow, look at you. <laughs> yeah, so I lived in Southern California when that happened. Okay. Um, and um, my dad and I had been going to Los Angeles Kings games um, since 1983 actually was my first NHL game. And, um, you know, the Kings were terrible. They, they were, they were a perennial also ran in the NHL in the early eighties, um, when just about every team made the playoffs, which is kind of still true today. Yeah. Um, and when they made it, which was infrequently, they were always the last seed in their division, yeah. which meant that their first round series was always against the Oilers. The best player, and, <laughs> yeah, best team. And yeah. I mean, so, you know, we were fortunate enough to see Gretzky when he played with the Oilers um, when they came to LA, because, you know, they were in the same division as the Kings. So they, they were there pretty frequently. Yeah. And, um, and they were unbelievable. And so, you know, when when Wayne got traded to the Kings in 88, you know, there's two um, very popular um, 88 Tops and Opeachy hockey cards of Gretzky. Um, the Tops card actually shows him at his news conference. Um, oh, yes. yes. He was holding up his sweater, the Gretzky sweater card. Um and it's very popular. And then the Opeachy card, which is, I think, a little less popular, um, although 88 Opeachy hockey is worth a lot more than tops, um, right. uh, shows him on the ice in his Kings jersey. Well, I mean, you know, when, when Wayne came to L.A., like, you know, hockey became cool. Yeah. And, and hockey cards, um, you know, sort of west of the Rockies became a big deal. I mean, prior right. to it was it was really only an East Coast and um, and Canadian interest, more or less. Right. Um, but as soon as Gretzky came to LA and hockey became Hollywood, um, then hockey memorabilia was a very big deal. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I mean, coincidentally, right around the time that you know the the junk wax era started. Um, so, you know, I mean, you had 9091 Upper Deck is a great example. I'm French series boxes were selling for like, you know, probably almost a thousand dollars a piece. What? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, there, wow. there are there are stories of those cases trading hands, you know, they're 24 box cases at like thirty thousand dollars. Wow. Um, or the 9091 Upper Deck High Number French. Um, Cards and I mean, you know, they were mass produced, um, just like most other upper deck products were and probably still are. Um, and you know, I mean, the reality is, is that you know, I mean, there was a lot of it out there, but but it was incredibly popular. And again, I think that you know, the market had just grown so substantially because hockey became very mainstream at that point. Because you know, I mean, really, other than Michael Jordan, um, you know, and Magic Johnson. You know, Wayne Gretzky was, you know, he he was it. Oh, yeah. Um, you're not kidding. I mean, I I, I didn't grow up uh, a hockey fan at all as a child. You know, we were baseball and football. But, I mean, I can't deny that when I started transitioning into hockey, it was, you know, Gretzky. Gretzky was the Jordan of hockey. And, and yeah. you you know, even me not really being like a, you know, understanding even at that time as a child, like the, 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 the sport as a whole. I when Gretzky was playing, I'd put the TV. I'd watch the game. You know, oh, he was yeah. he was fun to watch. 
I mean, let's put it this way. When we started going to Kings games in 1983, you could buy tickets basically at center ice um, in the upper level, but down pretty low. So really good seats um, for like five to $10 each. What? Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean the the Kings had a hard time drawing fans. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, so they basically gave away tickets. You know, I mean, I remember going to the games, and you know, of course, all of the Lakers championship raft um, banners were up in the rafters, and like you know, just being yeah. in that building was so amazing because that was right around showtime, right when the Lakers were at their right. very best. Um, and you know, the Kings were terrible. I mean, like, <laughs> if they won a game, it was a miracle. Um, I they mean, were we paying the fans to come in. <laughs> they lost, like, you know, 7-1 or, you know, 6-2. Yeah. I mean, they, they lost a lot of game by, games by a lot of goals. Um, yeah. But when, when Gretzky came, you couldn't get a seat more. I yeah. mean, the whole, the, the, the whole notion of hockey in California – really changed and yeah. so you know i'm proud to say i was a fan before then um but um you know have have always you know really had a lot of passion for hockey yeah no and it's evident michael you know i've seen uh, your posts online and with your amazing collection that we're going to see here in a bit um and, and and that's why i really wanted to talk to you um you know about hockey cards was because you know i could just tell that there's a there's definitely a deep passion there and uh and you would have a lot of uh, great insight, which, which thanks. I mean, even just in the few minutes we've been talking, I've, I've learned quite a bit already. So, um, you know, well, hopefully that, I'm passing knowledge that I've learned from others effectively. Again, <laughs> my, my pre fifties knowledge, not so great. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I have, I have really enjoyed it. Like I was saying, when we were talking a couple weeks ago on hobby talk live, I just think that the, the concept of, you know, really like aligning what's really cool about the the stuff we collect with the people that we get to collect it with um you know has has just been really cool really yeah. amazing yeah sure has so let me ask you this buddy what um in terms of iconic cards i know we kind of tapped into uh what seems to be the obvious one here in gretzky but but talk and, and you mentioned before gordy how 51 that makes a lot of sense of course um the you know what are some of the other iconic cards in in the world of hockey and i'll just say one real quick because i i remember this one only because of how wacky to me the card it reminded me of 55 bowman um you know the card that had like the, almost a tv look to it but i believe it's it's hull Paul's rookie is like close. It's, like a, close. Uh, it's it's Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr. Um, oh man, <laughs> who, who scored probably the most remarkable Stanley Cup um, winning goal? Like, there's a very famous photo of him flying through the air uh, um, after he scored it. Um, and I think they were playing the Blues, if I recall correctly. Um, and the Blues won the Stanley Cup a couple years ago, and I think that was their first return to the finals since wow. uh, they had they they had that rather heartbreaking experience. So yeah, um, I, I think that you know as far as iconic cards are concerned, you're right. Um, you know the '66 or is right up there. I mean, if mm -hmm. if we go back to the beginning of time, I think the the Vezina um, and the Art Ross from the those very early tobacco issues, and then there's another postcard set um from that era i think sweet caps if i recall correctly um their logo is on the back of some t206s they produce some full size like sepia black and white um uh, postcards of hockey players at the time and i don't think there's any like rookies per se in there but those cards or postcards i should say are are very desirable really really hard to find in high grade um and and really popular um and then i think that you know as you get into the 50s certainly the how and the richard from 51 um uh parkhurst um i would say that you know from 54 you've got the the gordy how card which you know is mm -hmm. is really well known um, and then, you know, for the 60s, it has to be the Bobby Orr rookie card. You know, yeah. I mean, 60, 61, you have Stan Makita, um, who was a very popular, um, very successful Hall of Famer. Um, but I mean, 
Orr was really, you know, the guy. And I mean, in 58, you also had, you know, the Bobby Hull rookie. Um, yeah. It's impossible to find centered, by the way. Um, but <laughs> um, also a very popular, popular card. Um, and then, you know, in the 70s, you know, obviously Ken Dryden in 71, Dryden, yeah. 72, um, he had a Topps and Opeachy. And then you've got the Guy Lafleur rookie. Um, I think that one's Opeachy only. Um, and then obviously 7980, right? I mean, you oh, know, yeah. he is kind of, you know, the, you know, other than Bobby Orr, I think that, you know, if, if you were to pick two cards, if I had to pick two cards for the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of of iconic hockey cards, yeah, I mean, it would have to be the 66 Orr and the 7980 Gretzky, right? Yeah. I, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's the only hockey card I own, buddy. Is 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 the Gretzky? <laughs> you know, but I had to maybe, have that card. Maybe this pack has one. Whoa. You never know. Um, <laughs> Hobby talk, yeah, rock rip. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Um, but, um, Love it. You know, I think that you know Gretzky, having seen him play, and I think that's really where like this connection you know, exists. Yeah. Um, it's the same way that I feel about baseball and the Dodgers. I never saw Sandy pitch, but I heard lots of stories and, you know, he's, he's always been one of my favorite Dodgers despite that. Yeah. Um, you know, I know a fair amount about how successful Bobby Orr's career was. Um, you know, even though I'm not a Bruins fan and, you know, I never saw him play just because like he was just, legendary yeah. um but you know wayne i got to see play and you know i think having that connection um is is you know really awesome yeah absolutely and then i don't really know candidly i mean certainly 80 81 you've got mark messier who was yeah you know an incredible player um 82 83 you've got grant fuhrer who i think you know for my money was the greatest playoff goaltender i ever saw you know with all due respect to patrick waugh and marty brodeur um you know i just and dominic Kasek, <laughs> I, I just grant fuhrer was yeah, i mean the guy was unbelievable um he was a beast yeah just absolutely amazing in goal and cool. so i mean certainly helped that, you know, he had Wayne Gretzky and Yari Curry and Mark Messier, you know, <laughs> playing on the same ice. Yeah. But um, the, the, the guy made it. <laughs> that does help, for sure. Players. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that that was kind of, you know, the the end of the the iconic cards. But there's certainly a lot of great rookies that that I failed to mention. You know, I think I only one I would add to the list again with my limited hockey knowledge, because it's just so much I see out there with it. And, and I obviously saw him play, too, would be. Lemieux, uh, the Mar excuse me, Mario, Mark, the Mario Lemieux of course, card. Mario um, Lemieux, yes, yeah, a, yeah. a terrible omission on my part. Yeah, you, yeah. you're, you're spot on. I mean, yeah, M Mario was incredible. I mean, you know, he he had some health issues um, throughout his career, but right, um, you know, despite that, you know, um, amazing player. It's just incredible, yeah. He was the only one that tapped into that list. I, I saw actually on Facebook a couple weeks ago about, um, I think it was points per season, the top like 13, and it's all Wayne Gretzky except for one. <laughs> it was Mario Lemieux was the only one that sprinkled <laughs> in there somewhere around like sixth or seventh, but then everything else from one to 13 was Wayne Gretzky except for that one. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, I mean, it was a game, right? I mean, you know, there was um, the, there in some ways, um, you know, there was a lot more um, offense, but then in other ways, there was a lot more, you know, clutching and grabbing. Oh, yeah. um, you know, there the the physical play went a little bit more unchecked than it does now. Yeah, for um, sure. <laughs> yeah, there was there was no concussion <laughs> protocol back then. <laughs> it was just, it was a very different game for sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, I sure. think about things that you know happened in hockey in the fifties and sixties. You know, goalies didn't wear masks until I don't know when in probably the late sixties. Um, I mean, I just can't even begin to imagine. Yeah. You know this 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 frozen vulcanized rubber disc flying at your face. 
yeah. and you don't have a mask on. And so like, you know, the game was obviously a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine 80, 90 mile per hour puck come here. And my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't sound too enticing, <laughs> but no, I give them a lot of credit. I remember seeing some of these guys in the eighties and they were still flying back and forth around the ice with no helmet on and all that other stuff. It was right around a time when things started changing in the game, but I saw kind of the tail end of that era. Likewise. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I remember, um, Ron Duguay, um, not wearing a helmet. <laughs> um, Craig McTavish, I think for a long time, didn't wear a helmet. Yeah. When we first started going to games in 1983, um, I don't think helmets were mandatory. Um, and so, you know, every year more and more of the players were wearing helmets and certainly almost all of the rookies. It was yeah. typically the, the veterans, the enforcers, yeah. um, you know, we saw Dave Tiger Williams play um, with the Kings and like he led the league in penalty minutes almost every year. <laughs> and, and so needless to say, the all -time there, were, great. <laughs> there were a lot of fights um, yeah. at Kings games. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are obviously lots of, you know, great yeah. highlights, but um, yeah. Awesome. So let me ask you this. I think uh, you you might have answered this already, but I guess let's make it official on this next question here. Uh, what would you consider to be the Honus Wagner of hockey? You know, I always ask this of any genre I talk about in the show. Um, even if you've already kind of said the card, what what would you, if you had to rank number one in terms of scarcity, I iconic, et cetera, what's, your hon what's the Honus Wagner? It has to be the Vezina. Um I, I, and I mean, you know, it, it happened to be issued around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's it's probably not the most popular. But, um, you know, when I think about, you know, the the card that that combines scarcity, historical significance. Right. Um, and and and, you know, and and the 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 stature of the player. I mean, yeah. the guy had has a trophy named after him for right. the goaltender in the league, right? Um, yeah, I I think it has to be that one. I mean, obviously, the Orr and the Gretzky um, mm -hmm. are more noteworthy. Um, they at this point are probably even more valuable in high grade. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I I think that you know the the Hannes Wagner, if you will, is is probably the best in a rookie, in my opinion. Awesome! I'm definitely gonna look that one up after the show. I'm curious. <laughs> so I think this is a perfect segue here, buddy. I I and you've already shown a couple. Um, I I've seen them even online, and and you've had some you have some amazing in pieces so can you uh share with us some of your wonderful collection so uh unopened or slabs or whatever you have i would just love to see that yeah definitely so yeah. um you know before i do i i just want to say that you know a, a lot of the the stuff that that i've been lucky enough to to purchase over the years has has come from you know, the people that I mentioned earlier that have been so cool to, you know, share their their knowledge and their love of, of hockey cards with me. Um, you know, I mean, loving the sport, you know, it was a really easy transition for me to get into um, hockey memorabilia and, and unopened. Um, yeah. And it really sort of propelled my interest in unopened because although I was a really big baseball fan, um, I always thought that the hockey cards were really cool yeah. um, and that, you know, hockey unopened, um, you know, was, was, you know, a little bit off the beaten path um, and super rare, um, yeah. especially the, the vintage stuff. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as I share um, some of the stuff that I have. Cool. So um, why don't I start with um, a couple of, cello packs so um this is a let's see if i can get it centered here there we go mm -hmm. this is a 1968 tops cello pack um wow. and so you know as i mentioned earlier um tops and opichi actually issued different products in 1968 for the first time 
And so um, this pack came, you know, during the first year of, of Tops, you know, um, NOPG issuing those separate products. Um, and I always really, really liked the 68 card design. Um, you know, I thought that, um, you know, just the, the way the cards look in this sort of landscape format um, was, was always super cool. And so um, I also have a um, 1963. Um, That's amazing. Pack. Sorry about the glare. No, no worries. Um, I'm actually going to zoom in on you there so we can get a nice look at it here. There we go. Sort of. I still see a little bit of glare. Yeah. Um, and so um, 63, um, you know, also like, you know, super, super cool design. You get the player with the hockey stick and then you get a little action shot um, next to the player right there. Um, yeah, that's a cool pack, design. I like that. Cello packs um, are are really interesting. Um, they They were likely issued in extremely low quantities. Um, I, um, I also have a 62 cello. I don't have it with me right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a 65 cello, which is sort of a precursor to the next question that I think <laughs> we're going to talk about. Um, but I'll, I'll save that. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Like my 62 cello, um, I've never seen a wax pack from 1962. Um, I've seen wrappers. And obviously, I've seen the cards, so I know that those packs were made, um, but I have never actually seen one in existence. Um, there are a few years. That's amazing. Of, wow. Yeah. So if you think about like baseball, football, and basketball, there are no years in the modern era where an unopened pack is not known to exist. But right. that is not the case in hockey. So there are actually a few years that, as far as I know, unopened packs are not known to exist. Um, 58, 59, 59, 60, 62, 63, and 67, 68. So there wow. are four years of tops hockey where I nor anyone who I've talked to who has <laughs> dramatically more um, history and information than I do has ever seen an, op an unopened pack. Actually, there's five years. I forgot to mention 66, 67, which is Bobby Orr's rookie year. Right. Um, as far as I or anyone that I've ever talked to knows, unopened wax packs do not mm -hmm. exist from those years. So like for 62, 63, a cello pack, um, which there are a few known that I'm aware of, um, is really the only way that you can get an open product from that year in hockey. Yeah, that's um, amazing to to, to yeah. even know that 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 was. Uh, I mean, that's a testament too to what you alluded to earlier in, in terms of the scarcity of the product. So the small base that was a fan of it was was shredding it, and there wasn't anything left at the end of the day um, for what would end up becoming an unopened, uh, you know, yeah. par a collector's paradise, if you will. Um, yeah. but yeah, that's, that, that's such a bummer. I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine, uh, for those that like to do pack runs, if they're in hockey, that's gotta be really rough to see gaps, if you will. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny because, you know, I, I certainly have had those moments where I've said, gosh, I wish that one of these would turn up for sale. But then the yeah. flip side is that like, it, it really adds to the mystery and yeah. the excitement of collecting vintage hockey unopened is that like someday something could turn up. I mean, I was talking to a friend this morning that bought something the yeah. other day that I didn't know existed. Now it wasn't a hockey product, but I mean, even still, like it was, it was amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it's the first time I've ever seen that. And I think that's second, really one second of the series Alf, right? <laughs> I didn't realize I was supposed to bring Alf for show and tell today. Um, but you I know I was going to mention Alf at some point yes. in this interview. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Alf has to be in every interview for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I mean, I just think that like, you know, it really adds to like the excitement of going to trade shows when they start happening again, of course. Yeah. 
Um, I've been lucky enough to attend the um, Sports Card Expo in Toronto several times. Um, and although there's not typically a significant amount of unopened product there, there's some, um, but less in more recent years. Um, the knowledge that's in that room is just incredible. Yeah. I mean, absolutely incredible. I mean, some of the guys that are set up at that show, a few in particular that I'm thinking of, um, you know, Grant Phelan, Bobby Burrell, Mike Frank, um, Bill Vollmer, just to name a few, um, know so mm -hmm. much about the history of hockey unopened product. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling. So, um, yeah. So yeah, that's I mean, all. It's, it's that makes it's, it that make that's just like an icing on the cake, right? When you go to the trade yeah. shows and you can just kind of like yeah. soak in so much on on a, on a topic yeah. that you're that you love, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Exactly. So I mean that you know it it adds to the treasure hunt, and and yeah. eventually if those products exist, they'll turn up. You know what's gonna happen, right? You're it's going it's gonna happen one year when you're at a trade show at a, excuse a trade show at a hobby show that you're uh you're gonna walk and one table here has that sixty two pack that you're looking for in hockey right across the way is the sixty two Mars attacks <laughs> <laughs> and you're like oh man which one do I get <laughs> yeah that's a good question but I I mean I would be running for the hockey pack I mean because. As as much as Mars Attacks is my true collecting passion, I know that those <laughs> cards are are out there. Uh, so I mean, for me, it would be no question. Like I mean, I would be I, I'd be running for the hockey pack for sure. Very cool. Very cool. So so speaking of, I've already shown you the um, the sixty eight and the seventy nine wax packs. Um, yep, those are. You know, I love I, that. I, I love hockey wax packs i mean i just think that you know the the graphics on the wrappers are so cool yeah they are they really pop they they really do and i mean you know the the 60s and 70s um you know i, I think we're we're really sort of a golden era for wrapper artwork for um for hockey and for um football and for basketball of course in the 70s specifically you know the the baseball rappers um in that era were i mean candidly they they were a little boring um you know i, I, still I don't loved, do, i don't disagree there was there was I still a couple loved of gaps. Vintage baseball but i mean they yeah. they use that that baseball um the the that standard wrapper with the red know, one yeah yeah with different color variations like a bunch. Um, 74, 76. <laughs> 66. Um, 66, but I yeah. think that, you know, the reason was because baseball, like, it didn't matter what the wrapper looked like. Yeah. You know, I mean, they that product was selling off the shelves. I think that, you know, Tops really kind of had to, you know, go the extra mile, if you will, to get people, kids specifically, to buy um, trading card products from other sports. Um, yeah, because they weren't really as popular as baseball, and so you know it, it lends to you know the the coolness of the rappers. Yeah, um, good point. So, so speaking of which, um, I've I've got this one. Um, this is actually really um, near and dear to me for a couple of reasons. So, this is a 1973 Topps wow. wax tray. Um, Tops issued hockey wax trays in 72, 73, 74, 75, and 78. Um, so as far as I know, they skipped 76 and 77. I've never seen Interesting. one. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but um, what's, what's really cool about this one for me is that, first of all, it was the last tray that I bought to complete my run. Um, cool. it, was, it was the hardest one for me to find. Um, but also it's my birth year. And so, you know, I think that that combination and, you know, my love for hockey unopened is, you know, really, um, you know, is, is the reason that, that I really like this one. And then finally, um, I have this, which is a 72, 73 hockey rack pack. Um, as you can see, wow. you've got... Art trophy right there in the middle. Um, 
uh, named after who did we say? Art Ross, right? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you qui- are you quizzing me? <laughs> uh, no, I'm quizzing myself actually. <laughs> and then, of course, there's um, a, a Guy Lafleur um, right next to the Hart Trophy, which I believe he won um, at least once, maybe more than once. I um, love this. And so, you know, also like even though it was a '72 slash '73. Um, still kind of, sort of associated with with my birth year. Rack packs have been especially difficult to find. Hockey rack packs. Um, it's probably because one collector that I know owns almost all of them. Um, so <laughs> he was he was on to rack packs long before the rest of us. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, but you know, again, you know, a great opportunity to to learn from someone who, yeah, uh, you know, obviously, you know, been been at it for for a really you know long time, um, because that's you know kind of what it's all about is is learning. Absolutely, well said. Yeah, and those are some wow jaw dropping pieces, and and yeah, I agree with everything you said before about the rappers too, the artwork. I've I've done a, a similar episode about basketball, and that was like a key, you know, like. Like I gravitated, those rappers were just like, you know, they were entrancing. I was like just staring at them like, those are really cool. I would love to own those. Same thing with the hockey. Even if I'm not familiar with some of those players, I just love between the history of it and not to get into long and winded, but I love that piece too. But just the bonus of having something that just looks like just amazing encapsulated like that. I love that. So, so great stuff. I love it. Um, yeah. Anything else really you want to show there before we move on or? Or, uh, that's or, all I brought with me today. Um, but if right. we do a follow-up, yeah, I didn't want to cut it. Out. I didn't want. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say we'll do a future episode, buddy. Whenever you want, because I I, I could I talk mean, about this all day. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to bring more. Maybe if um, if JB and Kurt and I are allowed back on Hobby Talk Live, I'll, I'll bring a little bit more hockey. <laughs> Yo, the door is always open. You know that. You. Uh, that Thank was a fun. That was a fun. If night, our behavior the last time didn't get us banished, then I'm feeling optimistic for the next time. <laughs> so, buddy, before I let you go, I'm going to do what I do with every guest uh, on Hobby Talk, and it's going to ask you that kind of a uh, little bit of that jittery question. I, I get the feeling you're 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 prepared for this one. <laughs> what is the one I, item uh, that you sold that you now miss the most, and why? You know, it's so funny because I was really giving this question a lot of thought. And and as is frequently the case when somebody asks me to name one of anything, like it's basically impossible. Um, (laughs) So so I'll name name two. Um, The first one um, was a 1964-1965 Topps Hockey Wax Pack, um, which I did not bring with me today. Um, but I was very, very, very lucky to find another one of. Um, so I'm I'm not feeling quite as much seller's remorse yeah. on that one. That was the honorable mention because you were yeah, able to get it back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it, it let's put it this way. I I sold it to somebody who we all know really well, and um and I tried to buy it back. Um, and he told me that it was his favorite pack. Yeah. And so I realized that, that, that was probably not going to happen. Yeah. And so, um, and what I trade actually I ended up trading it. Um, what I traded it for was also really cool, but I found in time was not nearly as important to me as the hockey pack, but you know, as luck would have it, um, the person that I had bought it from had two. Um, and, um, eventually I had an opportunity to buy the other one. Um, That's awesome. and then, you know, I, I don't think an interview about hockey packs or hockey cards would be complete without mentioning my very, very dear friend who passed away last May, Mike Bukala. And, you know, um, you know, Mike loved, um, hockey yeah. and, and hockey cards and unopened hockey product. And he and I had countless conversations about hockey packs. Um, 
know, I mean, he loved it and I did too. And I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss Mike terribly. Um, yeah. His passing was, was, you know, devastating for so many. And it was because, you know, he was a friend and we loved him. And, you know, when, when yeah, Mike guy. and I, great guy. he was just fabulous. And when Mike and I would talk about mm. hockey and hockey cards and hockey packs on occasion, we would buy and sell stuff from each other. And I sold him a pack, um, a 1965 Tops um, hockey cello pack. Um, I wow. had a wax pack, and um, the cello pack had a player from the New York Rangers on top. And as far as I know, it's the only 65 Tops hockey cello. Um, <laughs> I've never seen another one. Oh, man. And, you know, and here's the thing. like Mike loved that pack. Um, and I'm just so like delighted that it brought him so much joy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, not a moment have I regretted selling it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it was, <laughs> it was certainly it. something that yeah. I talked a lot about, um, and so, you know, it was, it was, it was one that got away, but it got away somewhere <laughs> awesome. And what, yeah, that, well said. And, and that's a great story. And I'm glad you brought Mike into the conversation because I didn't get to interact with him anywhere near as much as you guys. It was, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I minimal, but I mean, the few interactions were fantastic and, and, and what a, what a gentleman, what a great person he was. And, and then, you know, um, after his unfortunate passing, I had an opportunity to talk more with uh, a lot of you offline. Just and and hearing these great stories was just a testament to the person he was. So um, the fact that you know we still talk about him to this day says, speaks volumes, right? About about the just yeah. the person he was. So um, yeah. and the fact that you were able to sell uh, and I you know one of the most difficult packs, you know to someone like that is also, and, and I'm not trying to blow your, you know, blow your uh, head up as we would say. Um, but I, I, I give you kudos because this is, you know, to me, what the hobby is all about. You know, I think you, you re realize that this would, you know, be in better hands with him, right? It was just something that you knew that he would just absolutely love. And, um, yeah. and you were, and, and you gave it to him. So, I mean, you know, you were, well, I mean, I to, get, to get it in his hands. So that's fantastic. Well, I mean, I think to your point that, you know, this hobby is amazing because we share it with like-minded people, right? Right. Um, and, you know, some people are big sports fans and some people are big sports memorabilia fans and some people are both. Um, you know, some people love their non-sports. Um, you know, it... It, there's just so many opportunities for common thread. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, in, in the world we live in, um, you know, that's not always the case. Absolutely. You know, there's, there, there's, you know, a lot of different opinions and that's a good thing, but sometimes those opinions are not, um, are not always, you know, received as as well as maybe they might should be um and i think yeah. when we when we look at you know our little hobby um you know all opinions are welcome you know everybody's yeah. yeah. welcome right like i mean it, it doesn't matter if you like hockey or baseball or basketball or football or if you're into batman or alf right mm. it's like you know, it's just, it's cool. And it really and so, is. You know, I've always appreciated that. And, and it's the reason that I continue to be as excited about sports cards as, as I ever have been. What, very well said. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, this, this group, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, even in the world of slap, there's always these nice groups in vintage toy interviews I've done and other segments of the hobby. Um, yeah. I've always gravitated most to to the unopened um, and and this, this this group of misfits that we've done the live episodes with. <laughs> There's ten thousand of us now. I know, oh, isn't that crazy? 
It's crazy. <laughs> but I will say this, and 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 it's I, I hope it doesn't come across as some sort of shameless plug or anything. I really mean this sincerely. Um, it was one of my biggest motivations when I did this channel was was uh echoing some of the words you said earlier was just these these connections that we have and it's like a safe safe place right for us to just kind of talk about the things that we love and realize you know there's there's a lot of connection even if they you know maybe you're hockey and i'm baseball and this somebody's alf but you know what there's a dotted line of all of it and we have these stories <laughs> and, all yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah yeah actually we're all alf yeah alf was a bad example but <laughs> But, you know, at the end of the day, yes, at the end of the day, though, I think it's great because, you know, we have um, these these cool stories like the one you just shared and other wonderful stories I've heard in, in, in previous interviews that are worth sharing because there's a lot of us that want to hear it. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. But I just really happy you shared that one. That was a great answer to that question, Michael. And thank you so much for showing your collection and sharing some great insight in hockey. And I hope to have you back on again real soon, buddy. Well, David, I really appreciate it. It's been an awesome time, and I'm looking forward to coming back soon as well. Great. Thanks again. We'll talk soon. Thanks, David. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching today's video. Please click on the like and subscribe button. Just a couple quick updates. We are officially live on iTunes, Google, as well as Spotify for our podcast. Go to hobbynetworkgroup.com for more details and links. Thanks for watching today's video, and have a great day. Bye.